Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 137, Daniel Whitby's Mystery and Revelation Inconsistent. Dr. Daniel Whitby was an Anglican clergyman and theologian. Born in 1653, he attended Trinity College at Oxford. He spent his working life in a series of ministry positions. One biographer says this of him, quote, He was a person very well read in the Fathers and in polemical divinity, especially as to the main part thereof, which is directed against papists. He hath been all along so wholly devoted to his severer studies that he hath scarce ever allowed himself leisure to mind any of those mean and trifling worldly concerns which administer matter of gain, pleasure, reach, or cunning. Also, he hath not been in the least tainted with those too much nowadays practiced arts of fraud, cozenage, and deceit. End quote. Dr. Whitby published over 40 works in theology and apologetics, and even a two-volume paraphrase and commentary on the New Testament. He died at the ripe old age of 86, and the next year, in 1727, someone published a book entitled The Last Thoughts of Dr. Whitby, containing his correction of several passages in his commentary on the New Testament, to which are added five discourses published by his express order. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, you'll hear his last, last thoughts, the final essay in that book, entitled Mystery and Revelation Inconsistent. You'll hear the whole essay. I've only replaced a few outdated words and phrases to make it more comprehensible to 21st century people like you. In just a minute then, Dr. Whitby on Appeals to Mystery. Let me first introduce his topic. Many times in the course of theological argument, one runs into either a self-contradictory claim or a seemingly meaningless or very obscure claim. There's a long tradition of trying to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat in such cases. One simply labels the claim in question a mystery and urges that it should be celebrated as such. In other words, the very quality that one would think makes the claim unbelievable, that it seems incoherent or unintelligible, that quality is asserted to be a mark of truth, at least when dealing with such profound subjects as theology. Dr. Whitby was unimpressed by appeals to mystery. In what you're about to hear, Dr. Whitby argues that a wise and powerful God would not present us with scriptural obscurities, which nonetheless all people, educated and uneducated, are obligated to believe. And he says that, quote, a just God will never require us to believe any article or obey any precept till we understand him and know what he means, end quote. And again, quote, The creator and preserver of mankind cannot take delight in puzzling his creatures with darkness and ambiguities, and in points, too, where their souls are in danger. End quote. In just a minute, then, some of the last thoughts of Dr. Whitby, Anglican theologian. But before we get to that, here's a little bit of listener feedback. This is from a very dedicated listener, Paul, in Minnesota, who discovered the podcast a few months ago and dedicated himself to listening to the whole entire series, somewhat to the dismay of his loving wife. But luckily for her, he's now caught up, or at least pretty close. He writes as follows, quote, After listening to podcast 132, Ten Apologists' Mistakes About the Trinity, Part 2, I decided to tackle the three articles you recommended on the Trinity, the one by you, the one by Baber, and the one by Howard Snyder. Other than feeling lightheaded for a few days, probably because my mind isn't acclimated to such rarefied air, I found all three overviews really helpful. I'm sure I'll have to review them again at some point just to keep everything straight. But now I understand better why you named your blog and podcast Trinities, plural. A few of the Trinity theories reinforced my perception that theologian philosophers are every bit as inventive as artists and other creatives. My goodness. A lot of that creativity seems wasted, though, unless one is convinced that the problem to be solved is, indeed, real. 
What I don't understand is where that conviction for which the Trinity is the solution comes from, at least for evangelicals. Catholics and others can, I suppose, pin their confidence in the authoritative decision of historical councils, which presents another whole set of questions. But it doesn't seem like those who place tradition on a lower tier than the Bible should be quite so dogmatic on the subject. I realize that if you really want to, you can read the Bible in a way that presents the Trinity as a real puzzle to be solved. But even if that is one possible way of reading the Bible, it doesn't seem like the most straightforward way. End quote. Paul, thanks for that very interesting and perceptive comment. Yes, I do think all three of those encyclopedia articles you mentioned are of use, and I still recommend them. The links for them are on that blog post for episode 132. Yep, they'll make your head hurt. They'll make your head spin. They might even make your head explode. But it's all perfectly serious business. There's no baloney, BS, or fakery in it. Your average Christian philosopher, and strangely, even your average Protestant Christian philosopher, just starts with the claims of the so-called Athanasian Creed. The reason is that those claims set up a neat little puzzle that just cries out for a person to make a few distinctions, to make the inconsistency go away. You see this approach in my earliest couple of publications on it. The main one is called The Unfinished Business of Trinitarian Theorizing, and I held out hope for some years that you could preserve a small c Catholic or Orthodox view of the Trinity, just making some of the distinctions that analytic philosophers were putting out there. But it seemed to me then as I worked through all the theories that they all had really desperate problems. Either they depended on speculations that I disagreed with, they didn't seem to match the Bible, or they created their own theological problems, such as making the Father and Son the same self, or two different manifestations of the same self. I think when it comes to interpreting the New Testament, that dog won't hunt. But back to the subject of Christian philosophers who are doing this kind of analytic theology, what's happened is they've taken the word of apologists that the Bible really does obviously imply all of that set of seemingly inconsistent propositions like you find in the Athanasian Creed or, say, in the seminal paper by Richard Cartwright. And I'll put a link to that on this blog post as well, because that's another thing that you might want to look at. What happened in my case is I went back to the Bible to see if it really did obviously imply those propositions. And to make a very long story short, my conclusion was, no, it doesn't. In fact, it states and implies something inconsistent with all Trinitarian theologies properly so called, which is the one God just is the Father and not anyone else. Another thing that's going on, and I've had conversations with well-known evangelical philosophers about this, they are simply unwilling to grant that God could have allowed the mainstream of Christianity to go wrong about this for this long. So they're presupposing a kind of argument against any kind of non-Trinitarian theology just from divine providence. I think that's a strange kind of argument for a Protestant to be making. Earlier generations of Protestants were more suspicious of the ecumenical councils, and I think rightly so. Earlier Protestants were more suspicious of bad theorizing, of ultimately indefensible speculations on this subject, and I think rightly so. Earlier Protestants were more inclined to think that the Bible itself says enough on this topic for us to settle our views so that we don't need a whole series of long councils later on. I'm inclined to think that's so also. Current day Protestants aren't very Protestant. In their own minds, they're basing everything on the scriptures. But in actual practice, post-biblical tradition plays a huge and central role in their thinking. And they're just not willing to entertain someone who wants to go back to the sources and argue that there's a better explanation of what's going on there. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a 17th and early 18th century Anglican Protestant theologian who's not afraid to acknowledge conflicts between mainstream Christian tradition and the Bible and who takes the classical Protestant view that, in cases like that, a Christian should go with the Bible.
The Last Thoughts of Dr. Whitby Discourse 5 Mystery and Revelation Inconsistent Deuteronomy 29.29 29. Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. That which we render secret things is in the Hebrew nistaroth, that is, mysteries, or hidden things which God has not revealed in his word, which I have elsewhere proved to be the constant sense of the word mysteria in the Holy Scriptures, from which it demonstrably follows that what is truly a mystery cannot be a revelation made by God, and that to require any man to believe what we confess to be a mystery is to require him to believe what God has not revealed in his word, as is apparent from the opposition here put between mysteries or hidden things which God only knows and things revealed by him to us, that we may know them and do them, and which it is impossible for us to do till we first know the meaning of them or what it is that God requires us to do. From which, secondly, observe that all that God requires any man to do in order to obtain his favor or avoid his displeasure must be so plainly delivered by God in his word as that all men concerned to do them may certainly know the true meaning of them. And by parity of reason, all that God requires any man to believe for salvation or the avoiding of his displeasure must be so plainly delivered in his holy word that all men who should believe it must be enabled by him to know the true and certain meaning of it. This will be evident first from the consideration of the wisdom and goodness of God, secondly from the nature of a rule which must be plain and of a certain sense, thirdly from the consideration of the persons to whom it is revealed that they may believe it and do it, fourthly from the consideration of the end and design of God in making this revelation to mankind that it may be believed and practiced by them, First, from the consideration of the wisdom and goodness of God. For sure, it was most agreeable to the infinite goodness and tender mercies of God to make everything which he requires of us weak men obvious and clear. The importance of the duty implies its certainty, which is not to be found in phrases either doubtful or obscure. A just God will never require us to believe any article or obey any precept till we understand him and know what he means. A righteous God can expect nothing from us but what he has given us the means and ability to perform. The creator and preserver of mankind cannot take delight in puzzling his creatures with darkness and ambiguities and in points, too, where their souls are in danger. He is not a rigid master who would reap where he did not sow. This would be a cruel mockery, unworthy of that being who has brought life and immortality to light. I think it but justice to the goodness of God to affirm that belief or disbelief can neither be a virtue nor a crime in anyone who has no means in his power of being informed. And a righteous God will condemn no man for not doing more than he was able to perform. The all-merciful being never requires of us that which, after our most diligent search, we cannot find that he requires. It is not consistent with his wisdom and goodness to make that necessary which he has not made plain. It is evident then that the all-wise God could not intend to perplex and confound weak minds with subtleties for the knowledge of which he has not given them suitable qualifications. Secondly, this will be farther evident from the nature of a rule. First, the true way to measure the essential properties of this or that means is by considering its sufficiency for this end. For whatever is necessary to make any means sufficient for the obtaining of its end is to be reputed an essential property of that means, and nothing else. Now because the end we are speaking of is the conveyance of the knowledge of Christ's doctrine to all those who are concerned to know it, in such a manner as they may be sufficiently certain and secure that it has received no change or corruption from what it was when it was first delivered, from this it appears that the means to know this end must have these two properties. First, it must be sufficiently plain and intelligible. Second, it must be sufficiently certain to us, that is, such as we may be fully satisfied concerning it, that it has received no corruption or alteration. If it has these two conditions, it is sufficient for its end. 
But if it lacks either of them, it must necessarily fall short of its end. For if it be not plain and intelligible, it cannot convey this doctrine to our knowledge. If it be not certain, we cannot be assured that this doctrine which it brings down to us for the doctrine of Christ is really such. From this it demonstrably follows that a rule which is not plain is no rule at all. Nor will God make a law binding or the transgression of it a sin until we know what it is. A just and righteous judge will condemn us only for neglecting to do that for which he has given us means and ability to perform. An all-wise God cannot prescribe a means in order to an end which he knows will not be sufficient to produce that end. Add to this, thirdly, that a perfect rule of faith and manners must with sufficient plainness and certainty contain all things necessary to be believed or done in order to the end of our faith, that is, quote, the salvation of our souls, 1 Peter 1, 9. And agreeable to these things is that inquiry of St. Paul, quote, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to the battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, usemon logon, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you will speak into the air, and quote, that is, vain and unprofitable words. 1 Corinthians 14, 8 and 9. And to deny this perfection to the Holy Scripture, which is our only rule of faith and the only treasury of divine revelations, is in effect to say that all that our blessed Lord and his inspired apostles have taught us in the holy gospels and epistles is insufficient to make any Christian wise unto salvation. It being certain that that which is deficient in any one thing necessary to be believed or done in order to our salvation cannot produce that end. Thirdly, this will be still more evident from the consideration of the persons to whom the gospel was preached, that they might believe it and do it. For seeing when God Almighty consents to make use of human language, he intends to be understood, and consequently makes use of words in their common meaning. That when he designed to reveal his will to little children and nursing babies, that is, to the ignorant and uneducated, he cannot rationally be supposed to do it in obscure expressions or in dubious and uncertain words, that being to do it so that they who were obliged to believe and do it could not know certainly what they were either to believe or do. From this must it necessarily follow that the gospel must be plain and easy to be understood in all things which can be the duty of all men to know in order to gain salvation. Seeing God, says the apostle, Quote, wills that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. In order to that end, he must have given all men sufficient means to come to the knowledge of that salvation, seeing our Savior sent his apostles to preach that gospel to all creatures, quote, which is able to make them wise unto salvation, end quote. He must have required them to preach it so as that the hearers of it may be made, quote, wise unto salvation, end quote, which is why St. Paul, in the name of them all, speaks in this way, 2 Corinthians 3.12, quote, seeing then we have such hope, he means of the divine assistance in execution of this, our commission, we use great plainness of speech, end quote, from which he infers in the next chapter that, quote, if the gospel they preached was hidden from any to whom it was preached, it was only hidden from them whose minds Satan, the god of this world, had blinded, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine in upon them. End quote. Plainly insinuating that the gospel was not hidden from anyone because of a lack of clearness on the part of those that preached it, but only by reason of that blindness which Satan brought about in them that heard it. And in the 14th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, he speaks to the preachers of Corinth, delighting to speak in tongues unknown in the assemblies of their fellow Christians, thus for their correction and reproof, that in this they acted like barbarians and as, quote, 
children in understanding that they just speak into the air, and quote, that they transgress the great rule which they ought always to observe in speaking, namely, doing it for the edification of their hearers, that unless they uttered by the tongue, usemon logon, words easy to be understood, their hearers could not know what was spoken, that he himself, unless he spoke by knowledge or revelation to them, could not profit them, and that therefore in the church he had, quote, rather speak five words with his understanding, end quote, so employed, that by his voice he might teach others, then, quote, ten thousand words in an unknown tongue, end quote. Now, is it reasonable to think that after these things said for the reproof of others, he himself, in writing to the churches, should be guilty of the same fault? That he should speak into the air, and so uselessly, because his trumpet gave an uncertain sound? That he, in his letters, should write things not to be understood, and by which he might teach the church, and so be a barbarian to them that read them? And yet, what if he delivered in those letters concerning matters necessary to be believed and done were not written by the Holy Spirit, and by him delivered with sufficient clearness? Both he himself and that good spirit which enabled him to write them must be guilty of that very crime which they so sharply had condemned. Shall we then be guilty of such horrid blasphemy as to say that the teachings of the all-wise God, designed to make men wise unto salvation, and to convey to them the knowledge of the truth requisite in order to that end, should be obnoxious to the same faults which the apostle so sharply reproves in the Corinthians? What would this be but to mend the word of God, to make it more useful than God has made it? to help the Holy Spirit, and to teach the Almighty how to express Himself, and in effect to say that the wisdom of the Holy Spirit has so written the gospel of salvation as to need His coming a second time with His infallible assistance to teach men who have assembled in councils to declare it to others so that they may be saved. This is a vile accusation against the all-wise God, our great lawgiver Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the inspired apostles. This, fourthly, may be demonstrated from the end and design of God in making this revelation to mankind. For seeing an all-wise and all-powerful God cannot fail in accomplishing the end which he designs to obtain, and seeing it is also certain that the end of God in speaking to men, what he holds necessary to be believed or done in order for their salvation, cannot be obtained by speaking to them these things obscurely and ambiguously. From this it is certain that God cannot be supposed in matters of so great importance to speak thus to those whom he designs to teach these things, since that end cannot certainly be obtained by speaking those things obscurely and ambiguously, but only by doing this plainly and in words easy to be understood and of a certain sense. Seeing then that every wise agent pursues his end by the most proper and effectual means, and writing plainly and not obscurely, is the most proper means to instruct men by writing. Seeing then every wise agent pursues his end by the most proper and effectual means, and writing plainly and not obscurely is the most proper means to instruct men by writing, from this it follows that the apostles must have used this means of instructing in their writings, or else they cannot be esteemed wise agents. The contrary supposition casts a vile accusation both on that blessed Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, and upon that Holy Spirit by which the Scriptures were written. For first, if our great lawgiver only taught by his apostles those necessary things obscurely in the Scriptures which are delivered as his laws to the Church, and so were continually received by it, he acted as no wise lawgiver ever did or thought fit to do. 
or do any of them make laws in matters necessary to be observed by their subjects so obscurely as that they shall not be obliged to obey them until they are interpreted by another law or another assembly? And shall he who is called the wisdom of the Father be supposed to do what no wise lawgiver would choose to do? Secondly, if the good spirit has so obscurely delivered his mind in Scripture that they who are concerned to do it cannot know sufficiently things necessary to be believed and done contained in it without an infallible interpreter, he must have written this book in a way that no understanding Christian ever wrote anything of the like nature. For never did any wise Christian write obscurely what he thought had to be known by them. For did ever any wise Christian write obscurely what he thought had to be known by them whom he designed to instruct? Does any good practical discourse need an infallible interpreter or any system of the principles of Christian faith? Or do we not condemn in others the writing in this style in matters of this nature? And shall we lay that to the charge of the good spirit of God? And shall we think that the good spirit of God does that which we condemn in one another? Shall we say that he inspired them to write to others that, quote, they might know the certainty of those things in which they had been instructed? Luke 1, 4, and that they, quote, might believe them and believing them might have life. John twenty thirty one, and yet brought about that they should be written so that they could not know the things they wrote with any certainty or obtain life by reading them? From what has been argued, these corollaries naturally and plainly follow. First, that what is not contained in Scripture in such certainty and plainness as that all concerned to believe and know them in order to the obtaining their salvation may not, from Scripture, be sufficiently assured that they are plainly and certainly delivered there as necessary articles of Christian faith and duty, and cannot be a necessary article of Christian faith, it being proved, first, to be contrary to the wisdom and goodness of God, to require that to be necessary to be believed or done in order to be saved, which he has not with sufficient plainness and certainty declared in Scripture to be thus necessary. For, as Mr. Chillingworth truly says, quote, Nothing is necessary to be believed but what is plainly revealed. For to say that when a place of Scripture, by reason of ambiguous terms, lies indifferent between various meanings, whereof one is true, the other false, that God obliges men under pain of damnation not to mistake through error and human frailty is to make God a tyrant, and to say that he requires us certainly to attain that end, for the attaining whereof we have no certain means. End quote. Secondly, it is as plainly contrary to the essential properties of a rule of faith, they being these two, that it be plain and certainly may be understood. And, thirdly, it is as clearly opposite to the declaration of God in Scripture that all things there necessary to salvation are delivered to all concerned, that they believe them and do them. For God being, quote, willing that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, end quote, must be as willing to impart to them the knowledge of these things which are necessary to be known in order for them to be saved. Christ, being the common Savior of all men, he must have provided means sufficient for the salvation of all them to whom his gospel was preached, he having given his apostles commission to preach his gospel to every creature capable of hearing and embracing it, and having said that they who did believe it should be saved, and he that believes it should not be damned, must have obliged and assisted them so to preach it, that every one that heard it might fully learn all that was necessary to be by them believed to be saved. Since otherwise the promise of their salvation must depend on a condition impossible to be known, and unbelievers must be damned for what they could not know to be their duty to believe.
Lastly, this is proved repugnant to the design of God the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost in revealing to us the things necessary to be believed and done for our salvation. For seeing this end can only be obtained by revealing those things, so as that it may plainly and certainly be known by all who are concerned to believe and do them, and seeing every wise agent, and much more an all-wise God, must use the means most effectual to produce their designed end, that is, must deliver them with sufficient certainty and plainness, it follows that what these have delivered must be delivered so as that all persons concerned to believe and do them may plainly and certainly know the true sense and meaning of them. And hence the excellent Bishop Stillingfleet, after a long discourse of the means whereby to know the sense of Scripture without an infallible guide, having confirmed this doctrine by many solid arguments, concludes thus, Quote, to say that, though the apostles and evangelists did deliver the mind of God to the world in their writings in order to the salvation of mankind, although they were inspired by an infinite wisdom to that end, although all things simply necessary to salvation are contained in their writings, although a person used his sincere endeavor by all moral helps and the divine grace assisting him to find out in these writings the things necessary to salvation, Yet after all, he cannot certainly understand the meaning of them. To me appears so absurd and monstrous a doctrine, so contrary to the honor of the scriptures and the design of Christianity, that if I had a mind to disparage it, I would begin with this and end with transubstantiation. End quote. Secondly, from this also it demonstrably follows that how confidently soever some men may deliver several propositions as necessary to be believed in order to be saved, if they cannot prove them plainly and certainly to be revealed in Holy Scripture, they must be plainly guilty of adding to the Word of God and making that necessary to salvation, which our one lawgiver never made so. To finish up, that this is the avowed doctrine of the Church of England is evident from her sixth article, which says, quote, that the scripture contains all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor can be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation, end quote. And also from her 20th article, which declares that though the, quote, church be a witness and keeper of holy writ, yet ought not to decree anything against the same or enforce anything besides the same to be believed for necessity of salvation, end quote. And from the 21st, which adds that, quote, Things ordained by general councils as necessary to salvation have neither strength nor authority unless they can be proved from the scriptures. End quote. And in her form of ordination of bishops and priests, she requires them to profess that they are quote, persuaded that the holy scriptures contain sufficiently all doctrine required of necessity for eternal salvation through faith in Christ. End quote and that they are determined out of the same scriptures to teach the people committed to their charge, and to teach nothing as required in order to be saved, but that which they shall be persuaded may be contained in and proved by the scriptures. And in her office for the 17th of November, she requires all her members to make a special profession of this one article, that Christ has so abundantly taught us all religion and works in the written word, that we need not believe or do anything, but only that which is there taught us. And in her first homily on this subject, she teaches all her children that in the Holy Scriptures is fully contained what we ought to do and what to avoid, what to believe and love and to expect at God's hand, that from those books we may learn to know God's will and pleasure, as much as for this present life is convenient, 
that there is nothing spoken in dark mysteries in one place unless the same thing is more familiarly and plainly taught, suitable to the capacity both of the educated and the uneducated, in another place. And those things in Scripture which are plain to understand and necessary for salvation, every man's duty is to learn them. Homily 2. From all which passages it appears that it has been the constant doctrine of the Church of England, first, that the Holy Scripture contains all things necessary to be believed or done in order to salvation, secondly, that what is not read there, nor may be proved from there, must not, by any counsel, church, or person, be required as a doctrine necessary to be believed, or a thing necessary to be done for salvation. Thirdly, that those things which must be believed or done in order to be saved are so plain in Scripture that it is every man's duty to learn them from Scripture, and that we may learn them fully, plentifully, and abundantly from the Scriptures, may prove them by them, and may show that they are taken from the Holy Scriptures, which it is certain we could not do unless they were contained in the Scriptures with sufficient evidence. Hence it is evident what the excellent Bishop of Salisbury truly says, that it is, quote, a scandal to the Church of England to suppose that it has any peculiar doctrines considered as the Church of England, end quote. She having so expressly declared that she knows no other rule but the gospel, and always appealing to that for the truth of anything taught by her, and expressly requiring all in her communion to take the scriptures for their rule of faith and practice, and consequently, the certain truth of any doctrine is not put by our Reformed Church upon its being the doctrine or the peculiar doctrine of the Church, but rather of the Scriptures. I conclude in the words of the author of a letter to Dr. Waterland, quote, I have the greatest deference for the doctrines of the Church, but then I must suppose that the Church designs to be understood for otherwise her articles of faith will not really be doctrines but words only. And as for our own Church of England, I can be very confident that she never once intended to bind any of her members to impossibilities or expected to have her articles understood in any other than a scriptural sense. And consequently, not to pin down men to the Athanasian sense farther than it may be made intelligible and consistent with the true sense of scripture. End quote. This week's thinking music has been No, 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 No's by Dr. Turtle. If you want to know how that title is spelled, or if you want to listen to or download that whole track, I've got a link to it on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Before we go, a big thanks to Jerry in Indiana for his donation through PayPal. Jerry, thanks so much, and also it was great to see you at the conference this past weekend. And all the other people I could name... It was great to meet and see all of you as well. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Help us to get the word out on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and so on. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. For some directions on how to do this, just go to trinities.org slash blog slash review. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Every little bit helps. And if you shop at Amazon.com, enter that website through a blog post. If you do this and then make a purchase, then without increasing your price, we get a small percentage. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. We're always open to show ideas, guest suggestions, objections, and so on. Sometimes I even respond to feedback in an episode. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>